Okay. All right. Well, we, you know, we have to do it. We're going to do a weekly show. And so we got to talk about what's going on. It's a new addition to Celtics beat. Thank you for being with us. Adam Kaufman, Evan Valenti, and of course, good friend of this program who we like to bug every couple months, Mark Murphy from the Boston Herald, who is of course, even closer to this squad than we are. He's there. He's in person. He's talking to players, talking to new head coach, Ime Odoka, watching all these games in person. And, uh, and, and fortunately is, is, you know, willing to keep talking about them even away from the team. He's not totally miserable yet. How are you, Mark? I'm good. I feel like I've already lived about 30 games, but it's, uh, <laughs> you know, five. So, so I'm, I'm glad you said that because this is, this is, well, there are a few things. One, this is going to be largely a mailbag episode. I, I think that we, we haven't done this in a while, Mark, and, and mm-hmm. Evan obviously knows that as well. You know, I, I think with what's going on handful of games in, it feels like time to really, you know, give a voice to the fan, to a listener. And, uh, and so we have, we have, oh God, I can't tell you. We received so many questions uh, on the heels of, of last night's loss, which was so frustrating there to the Wizards. Oh. But I, uh, I, I picked some of my favorites, and I think they really align with a lot of the talking points that we would otherwise have anyway. So, you know, we'll, we'll get into those as, as Excellent. we sprinkle on through the show. Yeah, it's, it'll be perfect. But, but I do want to start with this before we get to the questions. So it's, it's been five games. As you said, it's, it's felt like maybe 30. It's been five games. We've had uh, multiple overtime games. We've only had one real blowout. So, you know, most of these games have been close. At times, frustratingly close, quite, quite frankly, you know, they, they shouldn't be. Now, we've seen guys, much like last year, in and out of the lineup already, whether it's COVID or injury-related. You know, Al Horford's been in and out. Jalen Brown obviously missed time right off the top. He's been very up and down, something I'm sure we'll get into as well. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've had the new head coach, Ime has complained about his team's effort, about energy, about attitude, about poor shoot arounds, talking about the team getting punked after the home opener, when they lost by a billion points to Toronto in the first game with, you know, full fan attendance, first regular season game in nearly two calendar years. Uh, it, it's been quite a ride, but what I will say is this guys. Evan and I, we spent so much time on this the last couple of years. Mark, I'm sure you were part of some of these conversations as well. Here's where this season is a win, is an absolute win so far with what we've had. It is a win for the crowd that has been telling you for a couple of years, don't just point all your fingers at Brad. This isn't all on Brad. This isn't solely a Brad Stevens thing. Don't just assume a new head coach is going to come on in and just fix everything. This uh, Get rid of hashtag fire Brad. We already have hashtag fire Ime, Mark. People are calling for Ime Odoka's head. I saw, it's I saw unbelievable. Her, I saw a couple of those last night, you know. And then the Brad, the Brad people are now going, see, wow. <laughs> You That's know, what I'm saying. Us. It's the but, same old crap. It really but is. What, but what Ime is trying to do, and when he was talking about Jalen last night, for example, and he referred to this is a guy who came in off COVID, has some lingering knee issues, same thing he had last year, and he goes up and down for five games, you know, from 46 points to last night. And <clears throat> Ime called this mind-boggling. Well, it was a weird know, term you, to you, use, you, wasn't you, it? You forget, you're forgetting the COVID and you're forgetting the knee. I mean, you know, that's and, – and the incredible minutes. I mean, he played 46 minutes against the Knicks. It's, yeah, for 10 days in quarantine. Ime, Ime has got a little bit of Thibodeau in him. He's going to yeah. play guys as hard as he can. Mm-hmm. So it's frightening, actually. <laughs> but it's he's trying he's he's trying to change that culture that existed under Brad, and he's already frustrated. I think, you know, last night was a sure sign, but just um, and they deserved it, you know. And to something else you were talking about. Those their two big low effort games this year were both at home. Yeah. So what's that? I mean, I think they're get. I think they're just they get very comfortable with themselves. They had a great win in Charlotte the other night. I mean, Charlotte is a good team, mm-hmm. but then you come back and do this. Montrez Harrell just, you know, he he might as well have just pulled up a chair to the bar and started eating. I mean, it, it, it was just, 
you know, incredible. Well, like I said, you know, I, I asked for questions after the game last night on social media. And w- one of the first I got, which was, you know, this is one of our real questions, uh, but but it was a real comment, you know, from Aaron said, after watching this, do I drink battery acid or bleach? Yeah, I love that's, that. that was awesome. Fuck, there's yeah, I mean, <laughs> Love you. That's that's how a lot of fans, you know, what, and I mean, it's yeah. an extreme, obviously. Yeah. It's not quite as extreme as Joakim Noah comparing Derrick Rose's knee injury to 9-11, if anyone didn't <laughs> see that on social media. But it, uh, it it's yeah. it's extreme. You know, that that was a reaction that a lot of people obviously were, were having after that game. And just to build on that, to build on what we've been talking about already, and these are like the conversations that I, that I have with you guys, that I have with friends that text me, that, you know, we're watching the games. It's, you know, how lost and confused players are looking so far early this year, and it's not necessarily you know literal visual finger pointing on the floor but the looks they give each other of not having a clue where they're supposed to be and right. when just not understanding right. you know email strategy and and people you know I, I i saw some of this some of the pushback people want to point to you know a lack of cohesion on the floor look you have new faces you have new bodies you have right. look I, I would love to as as you know without like the green goggle glasses i'd love to sit here and make that excuse i really would it would help me sleep at night but here's what it comes down to. You can point to a lack of cohesion all you want, and and there's something to that on offense. I will give you that. And rotations and inconsistency, there's something to that for sure. Yeah. But on defense, guys, on defense, players said this. Like Tatum has said this. Brown has said this. He may have said this. You know, Horford said this the, last night. Effort. It's just effort. It's effort. Right. It's energy. Yeah. Like it, I, I know there's an yeah. element of being where you need to be, but more than that, it's effort, it's energy, it's intensity, it's, it's will, it's desire. It's, and mm-hmm. that has been missing. And I don't understand yeah. Mark, how that has been missing five games into a year when you have new players, you've improved your team. You have depth, right. you have more right. depth than you had last year. And you have a, a, a new head coach who's just, you know, everybody was so high on, you know, like Brown and Tatum, especially obviously as, as the pillars of this team were so high on, on having a guy that they had played for in the past with team USA. And in, in obviously the FIBA tournament a couple of years ago, smart was there as well. So high on this guy coming in. And I'm not sitting here telling you that Ime Odoka like stinks. He can't coach. He's going to be bad. Get rid of him today. But the fact that there isn't a higher level of personal pride right now, I don't get it. Yeah. I think one thing schematically, I think that I think a lot of these guys are having trouble with the switching. I think, you know, there's a lot of communication that isn't there. I can't tell you, you know, why is why is Rob Williams on the perimeter when Montrez Harrell has the ball in the paint. I mean, it's, you know, he's caught out there a lot because he switches out there. So, you know, they finally had to make an adjustment the other night in Charlotte where they switched four guys and left Rob basically on the big. I mean, maybe that's a system you have to go with, but I don't think they're there yet in terms of, this whole switching thing. I mean, I think they may have to go more traditional at some point. But doesn't that also come back to coaching of, you know, yeah, knowing, it does. knowing it knowing, does. It, like it's, it, it shouldn't be in this, again, a, a text I got from a friend, like it shouldn't be switch everything or switch nothing. There, there's right. that exactly. middle ground that for some exactly. reason they're, they're not understanding. I mean, you need, let's face it, you need the time lord at the rim. You don't want them out there. It's, uh, you know, that if he if he had been properly positioned last night, then you wouldn't be getting killed by Harold every time he's in the paint. It's, you know, so that I think they have, yeah, it's coaching, but they have the coach has to make that kind of an adjustment. And he he also said just to get the guys used to switching. He was probably overemphasizing it, but, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that's hurt him. Tell me how you feel about this, and, and then we'll let Evan go, too, because I know I've been monopolizing this. But, uh, you know, this this was something I got from someone. I think I think Brad did a really smart thing when he took over, of course, you know, nine years ago at this point, where he said, listen, this is going to take me some time, you know, to learn how to do this, to figure everything out. Whereas Ime came in and acted like, and I, I just, I, I'm including this largely because I laughed out loud at this. Mm-hmm. Ime came in and acted like captain accountability. Like he's above all the mistakes that are being made. <laughs> right. It's bad management right. and it's alarming. Right. Are right. you seeing some of that? Yeah. And he's, from our standpoint, it's like, 
we love it because he says what he thinks. Uh, but what he does is he he's called his players out quite a bit already. Um, and that's going to take some getting used to. But, you know, Brad, Brad was uh, Joe Biden, you know, compared to this. <laughs> yeah, but, Brad went eight years and didn't call a guy yeah. out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, already it's, you know, we're going to get our asses kicked where, uh, you know, it, it's, he just, it's going to, it's going to take a little bit. I'm wondering how the vets are going to respond to it. The mind boggling comment. I'm curious about mm -hmm. how, what Jalen thinks of that. Yeah. I mean, this is, we got to give everybody time here uh, in one respect because every, this is all kind of brand new for everybody, you know, um, you know, I was as thrilled as anybody about the email hire. I think he's, he's great. And I, I, I do believe that him calling guys out, like this is kind of necessary. This team shouldn't be playing the way it is. So I'm not here to say that, um, what email isn't saying is wrong. Um, I'm, it's just such a stark difference from what we're used to that. It's like alarming. You're like, Whoa, whoa what, what's going on here? Um, you know, in, in again, I'm just, Emay's rotation's a little weird to start. He's got to get used to being a head coach. And there's, and there's right. you know, certain things that you have to get used to. Like, where's Aaron Neesmith in the past couple of games? Pritchard doesn't play last night in that game against the Wizards. That's weird because Pritchard's been, you know, he's one of the steady guys off the bench in, in, right. in, in last year and according so far this year he's been pretty steady. So, I mean, I, I like watching him. I know Dennis had a hot hand last night. Um, but, you know, it would be nice to get Peyton, Peyton in there, get him some run because he can space the floor really well is good tempo to himself like he and he you know mucks things up so to speak so you know I, I like some things i see like i don't like some of the things that i see but the defensive stuff is the most jarring stuff and just guys that don't communicate that well yet it looks like they're trying to learn a new system they're not used to yet and the stuff i was having a conversation with somebody the other day about this it's like boston leads the league in blocks but they're not isn't necessarily a great thing to lead the league in right <laughs> you you have great timing anticipation but it also means people are getting to the rim too yeah. And as much as I love watching, you know, Rob Williams, you know, launch balls into the third row <laughs> and him come out of nowhere. He just like, he does so many things that are just like jaw dropping that nobody else can really do. Like, I mean, I'm talking like not that many guys can do what Rob Williams does in the defensive end where he guards one through five because they can, they switch. So he's the guy on the, as, as Mark was saying earlier, he's the guy on the perimeter guarding, you know, Bradley Beal, why Ma while Montrez Harrell's in the paint with Dennis Schroeder on him trying to get position. <laughs> you know, it's not really a great look. And some of the things, like if you look at some of the advanced stats with Jason Tatum right now, like I'll throw this at J Tatum's defense has been a little off, a little, a little off to start the year too. And some of the things that I don't like is him like not fighting through screens to get to it. Like there are so many guys that are going, they're switching deep defensively and they're going under screens leaving three point shooters wide open. I'm like, instead of doing that, why doesn't Tam just fight through the screen and, and get a hand in there instead of waiting for the guy that's helping to step? Like, it's just, it, it seems like this is going to take time. Okay. And like, again, some of the numbers are, are great. Like, and at some points they turn it off. Like yesterday, the third quarter, they're pressing full court. They're, they're getting in guys, air spaces and, and ratcheting things up. And that's when they made their comeback. And I love that. Like, that's awesome. Like the intensity was great. You know, the uh, the ball pressure, like, it felt like times last year Brad would wait too long to do that. I like the fact that Ime's going to go to that a little bit earlier in games to try and swing some momentum, so I like that. But there's some other things that need to fill out. I mean, look, five games into the season, not exactly what you're looking for, um, but there's a long way to go here. Uh, but the, the unfortunate part is it feels a lot like last year. Even though there are so many new faces, including the head coach, there's still this, like, weird vibe surrounding this team of, like, you know, uh, like there's like a stink that they can't wash off. And the, the contrast is when Brad first came in, no expectations. Who cares? They bottomed out. If Mark is smart, we're building something here. With Ime, you now have a team that's had two young guys go to the Eastern Conference Finals a handful of times. There's a decent amount of expectations that are riding on this. So, you know, there is a little bit of a runway, but that runway is much, much, much shorter than Brad's was when he first got the job. It is going to take time and just, but the effort thing, I mean, you know, mm. where does, where does that come from? So we, uh, one does, of it our come from shoot, does it come from shoot around? Is that where it comes from? Is that where energy is? is I mean, 
that's where they leave their energy before the game. I will say this. He, uh, you know, he's, he's, the, he's the new sheriff in town and so forth, and he's going to coach him harder. And, but he's, just for example, he hasn't, he's been pretty generous with his off days or just lighter workouts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's not like, he's not Pat Riley. You know? yeah. Well, and you can't be in 2021. You know, you just, you, yeah. you just, you, you can't even get away with it. Obviously the, you know, players expect a certain, you got to cater to, to today's superstar in large part. Brian asks, uh, this is, uh, I think a, it's a good kind of overarching point. We've talked a lot about this, so I don't know how much you want to uh, expand upon it, Mark, but, but I, I do think there's something here. Why for the fourth season in a row is this core group so soft players with no effort, no heart. Why do our star players, of course, namely Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, not make this team better. Why does this team have no identity? You know, obviously, like you said, takes a little time with a new head coach, but uh, but but to the the theme of it all, the fact that this isn't strictly an EMA thing any more than it was strictly a Brad thing, and we have some common denominators here on the floor. What do you make of it? I I think at this point uh, it goes on to your two leaders, right? It's one thing I found. One thing I found interesting this week is Ime's clearly backed off this whole concept of team captains. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that was a it, weird excuse. Like, I haven't had time yeah. because of injuries? Yeah, no. It, it's What I think he's found is he's finding some guys certain leadership characteristics to be questionable. I think... Well, I think the smart missing the, the flight... Smart missing the flight... Was a real um, problem for that. And if you... And I wonder if if you don't make Marcus one of your captains, do you create a problem there? Because now sure. he, he clearly believes he's the guy. He's very mm -hmm. proud of being the longest tenured Celtic. You talk about Tatum's defense. I mean, I thought he's not as good defensively as he was three years ago. You know, he had one year when he was really starting to show that side of his game and actually Jay Laranega challenged him. He showed him that, you know, Kobe was an all defensive player, blah, 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 you know, and, he, and Tatum's response was, yeah, those are the guys I want to be like, but he has, it's, uh, you know, it, it's entirely rooted in the offensive end with him right now. And, you know, this is another, another bad trend from the old team when their shots don't fall, they check out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where he is right now. He's still arguing with refs. He got a T last night. You know, he's, uh, he's up there in Rashid Wallace territory already. <laughs> and it's, uh, yeah, there's not that commitment to getting back in the defensive end. And I've always felt that Jalen's not as good defensively as he should be. We, we can go quickly with this one. Michael just says, are there, are this year sees Mark, more or less frustrating than last year's Celtics. Uh, my answer actually to this is, is relatively easy, but I, I want to know what you think. I say less. Last year's Celtics just reached such a point of frustration. I mean, after a while, people just didn't know what to ask anymore. <laughs> the, well, no, I'm serious though. Like, what do you, what, we ran out of things to talk about because it was the same thing all right. the time. Right. And again, it feels very similar this year, but we don't have the volume yet. So I don't think I'm, I'm, you know, with Mark on the less, to be honest with you. So I, I'm going, yeah, I mean, if we're looking at the total package, if we're looking at volume, you have no choice but to look at last year. But if you're looking at just simply the signs and ignoring the sample size, I'm going to go with this year. I'm going with this year for this reason, though. Last year was just such a mess between man games lost for COVID and, and injury that, like, you just knew. You just knew they – like the ceiling had been stripped away, you know, that they, the potential, they were never going to get to a certain point because they just, the, the whole, you know, your greatest availability ability is availability. They couldn't stay on the floor. They just, they could not stay on the floor from the regular season onto the postseason. And so at a certain point, you just kind of hate watch the team. <laughs> you just kind of said, ah, what the hell? Like they're not going anywhere, but I'll just tune in. Like this team is more frustrating because they have generally speaking, all the pieces available to them on a given night. So that's, that's where my frustration lies. That's why I think if, if this trend continues, this whole up and down trend continues, which it certainly looks like it will for a while anyway, 
you know, I, I think we're going to be talking about this team as being the more frustrating one. Agreed. I'll, I'll add because this team's more more talented than last year's team. It's very evident Absolutely. that they're way more talented. Like they're it's just oh. it's like it's like night and day. This team has way more talent up and down the board. The bench looks like a, a bench of actual NBA players and not just guys that are tenth, eleventh, twelfth minute. Like the development of Grant Williams being a guy that was unworldly frustrating last year to a really solid player this season so far. Uh, Dennis Schroeder is the backup point guard. He's been tremendous. And I, I know some people don't love him, but he can at least carry an offense for a while. As we saw uh, last night against Washington, the second quarter, he had, what, 15 points in the second quarter? Mm-hmm. He was unbelievable and, and kept mm-hmm. Boston afloat in that game. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's more frustrating like five games in if you had the five-game sample size. Um, and it has the ability to be way more frustrating mm-hmm. last year because the talent's just way better. And, and it's so obvious that it's better. Um, but yeah. obviously, with the volume, we're not quite there. Well, you know, you know who might have actually found a role. Jabari Parker doesn't look bad that second no or to roll off the bench. He's had he's had a couple of good games now, but I I think that they have to work it out better than they have. Obviously, <laughs> you'd think, and, right? And and it's you know, maybe they don't know what they've got completely until December, but I think, I think you're going to see a good team by December. You mentioned Schroeder, Evan. So let's go to Christine's question and uh, it's multifaceted here, but it ends with Schroeder. When will this organization admit that these three core pieces, I'm assuming that means, you know, Tatum and and Brown and smart uh, will not work together. We missed the boat on trading smart. He's not a starting point guard at this point. Schroeder should start bring smart off the bench. I got a lot of comments about start Schroeder, bring smart off the bench. There were a lot of people even that weren't tweeting at me that were tweeting that last night. How do you feel about that, Mark? Is that a, uh, I know some people, some people have a, you know, a stigma about them for lack of a better word, where they say you're paying that guy that much money. You're going to bring him off the bench. He has to start. Look at what Schroeder's making. He has to come off the bench. The finances need to work. Ignore that. You know, coaches don't care about that. Coaches yeah. care about what works best and leads you to wins at the end of the day. What is the best winning formula? Is it starting Schroeder and putting Smart off the bench or is doing what they're doing? I think uh, Schroeder had the best season of his career as a sixth man, and I think that's where it should be. Um, smart. And when you play them together, that's maybe your best defensive team. But it's uh, – No. I would, I would bring him off the bench. Mentally, he seems to be very accepting of that role. Mm-hmm. Mentally, I'm not sure Smart would be so accepting of being moved onto the bench. Well, never I mind mean, that. Who's, who's the scorer off the bench? Like, Marcus Smart is not yeah. a guy that's going to carry your offense. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. Dennis yeah. Schroeder already has shown that he can do that. And, yeah. and uh, the point being, well, if you go off to a better offensive start to start the game, then the scoring off the bench won't matter as much. It's a long game, yeah. a very long yeah. game. And to, to, to have pockets, you know, how do you stagger Jalen and Jason so there's, not, there's no stagnant, uh, you know, spacing on the floor or the, the, the offense is going to stale? I mean, having Dennis Schroeder helps you solve that problem. So yeah. Schroeder's just fine where he is. Uh, as Mark said, the lineup data – um, with Schroeder, with Smart, and some other guys on the floor is very encouraging defensively. There's some of their best defensive lineups have him on the floor. So, again, Schroeder's been tremendous so far. It, it, what an addition for the money they're paying him. But right now, again, just for continuity's sake, no, Smart has to start. And especially because Smart's not going to dominate the ball as much as Dennis does. Like, Dennis feels like a guy that if he gives it up and gets it back, you're not getting it back. That's just the way it's going to be. And when you have him playing with a second unit that it hasn't have a lot of shot creation on it, it works a lot better that way. Dennis is wired that way. So it just makes more sense not to start him. And we got a question your, from uh, – oh, go ahead, Mark. To your earlier point about Pritchard, I think Pritchard and Schroeder are actually a not bad combination. You know, that he does, does offer another option. We got a question from Diego, which uh, I I meant to read with the last question because they go in line with one another. So I'll I'll turn it a little bit. But what Diego wrote was, uh, one, what is going on? Two, should Schroeder be starting over smart? Three, what the funk is going on? He didn't write (laughs) funk. Uh, Four, is it too early for any of these questions? So I I, want to focus on number four because uh, I remember back when I was doing minor league hockey, 
and uh, and and there was a head coach. I believe it was Scott Gordon at the time. Providence Bruins went on to be an NHL head coach, and he uh, he would have these speeches with the locker room, and and he had you know on a on a whiteboard in the locker room, the season was broken down in five game segments. Everything throughout the year was viewed in five game segments. Whether you were successful, whether you were unsuccessful, it was on to the next five after that. So, so what do we have? Quick math was 16 ish, five game segments over the course of an NBA season. I think, I think that math checks out mostly. So, I mean, this is one, this is one five game sample that we have so far where the Celtics have been blown out once they've gone to overtime twice. They've won a couple games. They've played all close games with the exception of that one blowout. Is it too early to be dissecting every little thing? I know it's partially our, our role here with a podcast, but is it too early to be dissecting every little thing after five games? Yeah. Um, you know, based on the old model, this you'd still be in the preseason. So, you know, there and Udalka has talked about that, that, you know, there, there's this a lot. And the, these guys clearly need to get to know each other better mm -hmm. i mean i think that's part of the problem and it and schemes and systems and all that stuff so yeah probably true we've spent some time on this one as well but just to uh attribute to joey here mark says uh, why does the defense suck if smart brown and williams are supposedly so great defensively and you could tack on a few other i mean you could add horford you could add richardson mm -hmm. you could add mm -hmm. you know obviously what tatum should be versus what he's right. been you know they're this was we spent a lot of time in the offseason the preseason you know as the the roster was constructed going into the year you know i'm sure i have a tweet people could dig up if they wanted to saying that you know this is a top five defense in the nba personnel wise yeah, sure. why has it been like 30th it's learning the schemes i mean they're they're not they're not communicating it's uh yeah i it it, it just takes time i mean they what you I guess the best example was how they won the Charlotte game. I mean, defense turned that around, you know, smart, had his, had his best game in the five that night. You know, but that's, you know, constant pressure on the ball, as you talked about. I, that's where they are. And, you know, Rob had 16 rebounds. Uh, he was 10. For, I want to say he was 10 for 13 or was that Harrell last night? Well, anyway, uh, you know, but they have shown what it can be. They just have to get consistent at it. Yeah, the one Max Letterman over at NBC, by the way, Evan tweeted, uh, Celtics have allowed 595 points this season. It is the most they've allowed through five games since the 70-71 season. Of course, I'll, I'll okay. add to that. You know, they've played three overtime games. Not three overtime games, but three overtime periods as well. Right. Right. So, you know, that's, that's going to lift those totals a little bit too. Well, my question revolves around how many of those are offensive putbacks? Because right. that's that right. is that is get the Toronto game and the last night. I mean, and, and yeah. it's been a, it's been a focal point throughout the entire five games so far. They are right. giving up way too many offensive rebounds, and right. a lot of times, right. offensive rebounds lead to good shot attempts, whether it's at the rim or kicking out to a wide open three point shooter. Right. And like sometimes, what what really stinks is like the offensive rebound and kick out to an open shooter. He misses it. It's like, Oh, he got away with one. And then they get their offensive rebound again. They find that same guy and he right. buries it this time. Right. Cause it's like, Oh, well, yeah, no, no crap. He's going to make two in a row. I mean, he's not going to miss two in a row from there. And that's, that's what I, this team, the, the, the offensive rebounding portion, I think might be the most frustrating part of this entire season so far, because that is how, you know, gain, and, it, and that's a lot of effort too, like boxing guys out, trying to find position and it hurts when again rob williams is on the perimeter right. and you're trying to get guys like to get in there and crash the boards but like you have so many guys that are so worried about getting the outlet pass and trying to push tempo because that's what they want to do as well they're trying to run more but you in order to run more you have to get the rebound first so it's like you know some of the things that they talk about you know from a schematic standpoint they want to do you know they can't quite do it to their full potential yet because of all these other breakdowns and again it all comes back to effort so you know, that the, that's maybe like two of my biggest issues are the transition defense, which doesn't seem to exist at all. And then the offensive rebounding rate for the other teams has been outrageous. So those are my two biggest issues, um, but with so far, and I think, you know, continuity is going to help that on one end, 
But again, both of those things scream effort to me. <laughs> you know, you guys both talked about Peyton Pritchard quite a bit, and obviously seeing him get the DNP CD for the first time in his career was strange the last night in a word. But uh, Mark, not you, Mark, but Mark on Twitter asks, uh, is it time to give Aaron Neesmith more minutes? Seems like they need an injection of shooting. We know they're going to take a million threes. It would make sense to actually play someone who can knock them down. Same thing applies to Peyton Pritchard, by the way. And, uh, you know, with what we saw from those guys in summer league, in preseason, mm-hmm. Neesmith in particular of late, does it surprise you that, that is, I guess is Emei going, and this relates directly to those two guys, we knew Ime was going to go with a tight rotation off the top, but is he going with too tight a rotation for a guy that should still be trying to feel some of this out? Yeah. Um, it would help if Neesmith got his first basket of the year. I think he's, <laughs> oh, I think he's 0 for 10 right now. But but how, how's no he going to get? No flow. No flow. No. He hasn't had that kind of run. And, uh, yeah, with Ime could definitely – create more space for those two. I mean, he like he likes Pritchard. He 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 gave Pritchard a lot of minutes early. So, you know, I'm not sure, you know, last all of a sudden Jabari Parker is the apple of his eye. So I I don't know. We'll see. Hang on, just a just a quick uh a, you know follow up on that. Mm-hmm. It's not like the other guys aren't hitting so the problem is like Jabari's shooting the ball really well from three-point range Grant's shooting the ball really well from three-point range Richardson has been a nice surprise from three-point range so far Schroeder's hitting 40 percent so the guys yeah. that you would put in the lineup instead like you would put uh Neesmith in the lineup over those guys are hitting shots um it's the yeah. you know Jalen is shooting 37.5 percent from three so far uh on eight attempts a game Tatum, 30% on 10 attempts a game. Smart, 24% on seven attempts a game. And, you know, those are the guys that aren't going anywhere. Those are your core pieces. And those guys aren't shooting the ball well from three-point range. So it's not like Neesmith's going to take Tatum's minutes or Brown's minutes, so to speak. No. He's fighting with with Richardson and Jabari Parker and Grant. Like, And those guys are shooting the yeah. ball well. So, when you, you know, it, as much as I want to see Neesmith, the other guys offer – you know, a little bit more. And again, they're, they're vets. It's like, you know, Grant Williams has been there for a couple of years. You know, Josh Richardson has a relationship with EMA from their time mm-hmm. in Philadelphia and he's shooting mm-hmm. the ball really well right now. So like I, I, I as much as I want to see Aaron Neesmith, cause I love him to death and I love his, his just like recklessness <laughs> where he just mm-hmm. throws his body all over the place. You know, they're not really, you know, the guys that, that are, need to shoot the lights out aren't and the guys that are the, the, the secondary tertiary pieces those guys are shooting the hell out of the basketball right now from three point range. So that's not really the problem. Um, again, a lot of your problem comes back to poor shooting efforts from your main guys. And so that's my, what, what I'm curious about is like what happens in this team when Tatum and Brown start really clicking, you know, and, and smart goodness. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I know, I know he was sick the other night, but and it would explain what, what one and nine from three point range against Charlotte, where it was like, it was like, Oh God. Yeah, but hashtag winning plays, man. Had that steal when he <laughs> I know. And that's the that's the that's the beauty of Marcus Smart. That's the chaos of Marcus Smart. So it's just like again, if you're gonna play Neesmith, whose minutes is he taking? Okay, why is he taking those minutes away from Josh Richardson when Richardson is in obviously a very plus player on defense and he's shooting the basketball really well? So like those are the things you need him to do. So I, I just don't I don't see as much as I love Neesmith, I don't see where it comes right now especially because unless Neesmith comes off the bench and starts hitting at an absurd rate, like he's just not going to play right now. This question, uh, well, I, we have other questions we'll get to before we get out of here, but uh, this one, I, I, I'm still getting responses to it on Twitter that uh, that, that I had posted and, and it jogged my memory. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, Mark, you in particular are here to address it because uh, Mark Murphy tweeted, Ime Odoka on Jason Tatum's triple-double potential. He's a guy that I feel should get five-plus triple-doubles a year. He's on pace for that with the way that he's moving the ball. Uh, Adam Kaufman quote tweeted that and wrote, I don't understand why this is important. A triple-double is a vastly overrated stat for both a player and team success. Uh, Mark, I just think the triple-double is so uh, – I, I thought it was – again, it was another curious thing, and I'm being polite in saying that. I thought it was a curious thing for Ime to say – because I just think that, you know, the triple-double is just such an antiquated 
Yeah. You know, like we spend so much time talking about how, how wildly overrated Russell Westbrook is who literally averaged triple doubles for seasons on end. I, I mean, look, don't get me wrong. It's fun to see a guy, you know, with a triple double, but it's, it's honestly, it's, it's about as interesting, you know, in, in a way as like a, a guy hitting for the cycle in baseball, you know, it's yeah. it, it like for people that I got a lot of responses to this, Mark saying that, well, what he may saying is he wants Tatum to be more of a facilitator and playmaker and rack up more assists. Fine. So say that don't say a triple double because rebounds have nothing to do with that. Right. That, that right. doesn't matter at all. Or blocks. If you were to get 10 blocks in the game, it's got nothing to do with that. Say yeah. you want him to, to average eight assists a game. That would be the point that he's driving at triple. If, if Tatum has five triple doubles this year, who gives a crap? Right. And, and the, actually when he said what he said, that was in response to a question about his, I believe he had eight assists against Charlotte. It was the 41.8 assist game. Mm -hmm. And it's just another way to measure somebody's dominance. Uh, you know, Fair. it's, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, it goes back to the bird magic era when that started becoming an important stat. Nobody ever talked about Oscar Robertson. Right. You know, I mean, literally averaged the yeah, triple double for a season. Yeah. Yeah, so it, but it, it's just another way to measure it. I mean, 41 points and eight assists, that is a pretty good reflection of a guy who's his offensive dominance. Sure. Yeah. It, so, it, so, that, so, so, so say that you want Tatum to have like, you know, five double doubles with assists because <laughs> we know he'll get some yeah. double doubles with rebounds. But right. it's just, it's the triple double thing is weird to me because it's not like, it, it's not like Tatum averages nine rebounds a game. And mm -hmm. so he's constantly getting those, those double, double games. And now if only he could add in the assists and get the triple doubles. Yeah. It's yeah. With Westbrook, what, what was the streak he had? Uh, I, I figured yeah, it was, it, outlandish. It, it, I don't even remember. you know, it, it got over hyped at the time, well, but it's, yeah. it, you know, it's just another way to hype a player. I'd rather it's have good. him go LeBron 27, seven and seven. I don't need a triple yeah. double. Right. Just want yeah. to see the activity, you know, the activity on, on both ends is what I'm looking for. I, the, the, this numbers, I don't, I don't, I could care less about the numbers as we've had with Russell Westbrook over the years. Like numbers don't tell you the full story. Like Russ is a freakazoid, but like, how does that impact winning? Does that, mm -hmm. does that allow your team to win? Is chasing stats going to give you more wins or does it just look nice in the box score the next day? I, yeah. I just care about activity, like 41, what was it seven and eight or one 41 six and eight whatever the hell the stat was, it was that yeah. was an amazing game and like he didn't have triple double but that was an incredible that was like the best game uh -huh. all-around game yeah in his life yeah. it was remarkable yeah. um the passing is clearly there but it's just you know triple doubles to me mean nothing especially when you don't get a win attached to it so you know if he if he doesn't average you know he doesn't i don't care 27 7 and 7 is a really good impactful game on both ends yeah. of the floor. That's all I, I would rather have that. I don't, I don't care. The points, you know, if you 28 points a game, cool. But if you're if you're you know somewhere near that 27, 7 and 7, you're a very impactful player. That's all. Right. Right. So uh our last set of questions, we won't ask them all because we've covered a bunch of them already. It comes from my guy Litchats, who uh hosts uh the over under podcast for anyone that's unfamiliar, mm -hmm. it's really good. Uh, he, uh, let's see, there, there are a couple here that we haven't really touched on, uh, at least fully, um, which is, uh, why are we burning Robert Williams out so early? As you mentioned, there's, uh, there's definitely some, some Thibodeau and Ime in, in that respect. Mm -hmm. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'll let you touch on that. The other one, as it relates to Ime, and, and we've sort of danced around this one quite a bit, why is Nudoka getting through to this team? So, you know, the, you can sprinkle the the minutes all of it in in together as as you tackle that one mark um he loves robert williams i mean he's the anti-brad as far as robert williams goes i mean he wants to use him as much as possible um and yeah it's you know rob has leg issues and so you know what be interesting to see if he gets him up to the 32 34 minute range per night um you know you guaranteed that he's going to be he's going to need some downtime i think you know it's uh there's a good chance he's going to robert williams is going to have some wear this year 
And what about with respect to Udoka not getting through to the team and some of the way that he I, is again, I think rest the team through the media and all I, of that. I think they're I think they're hearing him. And I think he's probably pissing some people off. <laughs> and you know, or you know, or it's the thing my wife says about me, you know, I'm I've developed a hearing problem. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's I get, um, I get a lot of that too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Oh, no, well, my, yeah. my 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 yeah. wife <laughs> my 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 wife made me go to a hearing specialist one time. He said, your hearing's fine. So <laughs> selective hearing. Maybe that's what it's all about. Yeah, very selective. Yeah. But but the point is, there's probably some selective hearing going on. Yeah. But isn't this what the players, you know, we, we've, well, I, I'm trying to think of, you can remind me to both of you. I'm trying to remember if the players themselves said this. I remember Ime saying it, that, you know, Tatum and Brown both told him that, like, yeah, we, coach us harder. Like we're, we yeah, want to be. Said, how did they oh, not, well, it sounds great when you say it, right? Yeah. Right. But it, I, I guess, I guess what I'm saying though, is it true? You know, do, do they actually want that? Good question. Can I push back on that? Because yeah. I, I think, I, and I want to end this podcast at a somewhat positive note at some point. So I was going to make this point. Sure. Yeah, it's a good time to make it. Yeah. Um, can we at least appreciate the fact that one of the things that E may wanted to fix when he got to the Celtics was their assist problem from last year. And so far through five games, no, it's only five games, Boston averaging right now, uh, they're in the top 10 in assists. They're right at seven or now at 25 a game. Um, And if you go to a couple of different other stats in terms of like advanced stats, Mm -hmm. um, in terms of potential assists, you know, passes that could lead to assists, Boston's fourth in the NBA at 52% behind Golden State, Minnesota, which is, you know, look, man, I'm pumped for cat just because they're winning a couple of the games. I'm thrilled. Golden State, Minnesota, and San Antonio. So if you're behind the Spurs and the Warriors, uh, you know, and that's it pretty much, you're probably doing something right. So one of the things that he may have wanted to, wanted to fix was this team's ball movement. And the eye test tells you that they're sharing the ball more, maybe almost too much at certain points. And the numbers back that up. This team does do a better job passing the basketball. And it, it comes from – a lot of different places. I mean, Tatum and Brown have at least upped their game in that particular regard. I mean, they're definitely looking for guys, you know, Jalen and Jason both making passes that you didn't see in the first couple of years. They're making routinely now. Um, you know, Schroeder, as much as I, you know, give him some, uh, well, lack of credit, I should say, for the ball being too sticky to him because sometimes it needs the game needs that. He does do mm-hmm. a decent job of spreading the ball around. Smart does that too. And Rob and Al are terrific passers as big. So that particular part of what E may wanted to fix has at least shown itself through the first five games. Just to throw out some of the other advanced stats, because I just pulled them up, people wondering where things stand going to this next Wizards contest. Uh, assist percentage, eighth for you uh, advanced stats people. Uh, it assist to turnover ratio, very middle of the pack, 16th. Uh, so they turn the ball over a ton. Yeah, it's just ratio is 13th. And then uh, where people always like to key in on some other areas, rebound percentage is uh, probably about as bad as you think it is. 26th is their rebound percentage. Uh, offensive rating, any guesses? Any guesses? Uh, probably, you know, middle of the pack. 17th. Yeah. So right there in the middle of the NBA. And how about uh, defensive rating? Almost last. It would feel that way, wouldn't it? 22nd. Lower third. Not great. Not, not great. Not quite at the bottom, but not great. No, not not great. So uh in, in the spirit then of of five game samples, guys, let's let's take it out with this. Let me pull up the Celtics next five games. Again, we know they've they've got the Wizards here coming up with the back half of this home and home. Uh, as people obsess over Tatum and, and Bradley Beal talking post game. Now they get to do it in DC. Uh so Saturday, a couple days from now, as we chat, five PM game. So four of the next five are on the road. At, at Washington, home on Monday against Chicago, Wednesday and Thursday, both on the road, Orlando, Miami, a little Florida swing, and then Saturday at Dallas. So we'll talk again here on this show before the end of this five-game trip. But, Mark, what are your expert uh, – or uh, five-game sample, I should say. But, Mark, what are your expectations for this five-game right here? How are they going to do based on what you just heard? I can see it going up and down the way, that, the way it has. Uh, Chicago's a good team. 
Yeah. Chicago has uh, impressed some people early. Uh, the trouble you had last night in against Toronto is going to rear itself again against Miami. That's uh, that's a tough team. You know, Kyle Lowry um, making a big difference already. I don't know if you've yeah. seen their on off splits, but he, Kyle Lowry was a, an excellent addition for Miami. Yeah. yeah. I'm amazed that team uh, could afford to give up precious Achua, but they did. I mean, he's a guy who's isn't one of those games Toronto. No. It is uh, no Toronto's right after that. They're the okay. sixth game, so they they begin the third five game sample size. Yeah, yeah, and then December's the killer that West Coast trip, followed by yeah, you got Utah, toughest, Portland, the Lakers, Clippers, and Phoenix. Uh, followed by the toughest home stand of the season: Milwaukee, Golden State. I forget the other two. You got Milwaukee, Golden State, New York, Philly, Cleveland. And New York's a good team now. Cleveland, yeah. baby. No a laugher. Look out. Yeah. Yeah. Cleveland's, play, yeah, Cleveland's playing hard. Right? Merry Happy Christmas. <laughs> Get ready for the Bucks. Uh, yeah, that, so I, I'm going to say, and it's, I don't know, this. it's going to sound like a cop-out, but honestly, I mean it just looking at this schedule. Uh, I think it's either two and three or three and two. I don't think it's going to be mm -hmm. any better or worse than mm -hmm. that. I think that's mm -hmm. what they're going to be in these next five. Yeah, I, think I, I, I feel run. like the, that go rebound is problem could be a problem with uh, with uh, what's his name, Vucevic, who usually gives yeah. Boston trouble. Yeah. yeah, I mean honestly, like Washington, and Orlando are the games that I think they're going to win, and then Chicago, Miami, Dallas, I could see going the other way. How about Jason Kidd though, playing fifteen guys? Well, the leadership <laughs> council told him to do it. It must, it must have been must have been the three you know gods and Loki or or whoever they were. <laughs> Unbelievable. I don't I don't know who it was who it was from the TVA that told Jason Kidd he had to make sure he played all fifteen guys. That's that's the reality that we're living in, though, folks. What a, what Poor a way Luca. to send us out. Poor Luca. Oh, that's she moved to the second floor. All right, we got to go. Uh, thanks to uh, Mark Murphy, of course, Evan Valenti. I'm Adam Coffin. And uh, rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff we always tell you as it relates to the podcast far too late when you probably already tuned out. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for being with us. Go Celts. See you later. Take care.